I'd like to introduce Gotham Sati, who is the economics professor at the B, in the BSEP program, and he's going to uh, guide this session here, and he'll introduce the panelists. Good morning, everyone. <clears throat> uh, as you know, this is our uh, session on payments for ecosystem services, and I just want to say a few words about what that is before we begin. Uh, sometimes while driving my kids to school, I give them math or logic puzzles to ponder over. <clears throat> this is just my way of uh, torturing them. As you might imagine, on occasion they protest. Being an economist, however, I don't give up too easily. I'll treat you to an ice cream at Holika, which is like the local ice cream store. If you figure this one out. <clears throat> Within no time at all, they develop not just one, but sometimes even two or three different methods to solve the problem. This idea, the idea that incentives matter, is at the heart of economist thinking and forms the foundation for, of Payments for Ecosystem Services, or PES. Under this institutional mechanism, caretakers of environmental services are compensated by those <clears throat> who benefit from such services. In effect, a market for ecosystem services is created. As one might expect, the idea that ecosystem services need to be commoditized to protect the environment has strong moral objections. Can nature really be valued monetarily? Do we not cheapen the environment when we place a dollar figure on it? In my opinion, while raising important moral questions, Pure deontological positions ignore the potentially positive consequences of such inst institutions, and by extension, they ignore the moral issues that stem from the lack of the realization of the positive consequences of such, such institutions. At the same time, top-down institutions are often unsustainable if they are inconsistent with the values held by members of a community. And therefore, it's imperative that PES is culturally appropriate. Aside from the moral objection, there are many practical challenges in the creation of PES. For example, how do we form baselines, which is crucial for estimating the additional services that, uh, that are provided, which in turn is necessary for assessing uh, payments. Further, how do we place monetary values on such services? And furthermore, how should such payments be dispersed? Should the compensation take the form of cash, or should it be delivered in kind? Should it be made at the level of the individual, or should the entire community that's providing the ecosystem services be compensated as a whole, maybe in the form of public goods? On the demand side, what form should the payments take? Should they be voluntary or involuntary? While this panel will not be able to examine all these complexities, the next three pre presentations that we have today will contextualize these issues through the lens adopted by each uh, of the presenters. <clears throat> we will begin with Alex Pfaff, who will describe the impacts of a PES program in Costa Rica, and who will argue that policy design is a crucial determinant of the outcome. He will also present some statistical results based on, uh, based on his research. Next, we have Juan Jose, who will provide a brief background uh, on Oaxaca, and then describe the proposed project in the Central Valley. He will also describe alternative approaches towards the resolution of acute water shortages uh, in Oaxaca. And finally, we have Lindsay Lusher, who will share her views on how her education at BCEP helped her view, uh, uh, helped to understand what PES is, and what the practical and logistical issues she faced as a student, both with respect to living in Oaxaca and doing her research, and how she overcome these hurdles, and finally, what uh, strengths she acquired through her experiences at BSEP and INSO. So we'll begin with uh, Professor Pfaff, who's uh, an associate professor <coughs> at the Terry Sanford Institute of Public Policy at Duke University. Welcome, Alex. OK, uh, so thank you very much, uh, Gautam, and thank you all for coming. And try to use the mic. And try to use the mic. OK, can I pick it up? OK, 
Okay. Ah, better. Thank you again. Um, okay. So this is very different from what you just heard, I must say. Uh, I have to say that I am impressed uh, with the uh, magnitude of the outreach we heard about in the last panel. I just want to say I thought the, the methods, the size, the impact was huge. This is completely different. This was a panel I understood to be uh, these payments for environmental services as a sort of one thing you could use to do interdisciplinary environmental education. So I'm going to try and take that cut, and a very particular cut at it, as uh, Gautam mentioned, essentially a statistical one. Um, and the two things that I want to emphasize in thinking about a program like this uh, are that I think when you think of educating students you, who sometimes will run away from the data analysis but really are quite capable of learning uh, these, uh, and applying uh, these analyses, uh, no doubt. Uh, I have students who have applied these in many places, uh, which is you really want to critically evaluate the impact of a policy using data. And this follows what Gautam said. It is very easy to look and say, you know, I did a policy and there's some good things out there. Must be that my policy caused those good things. And that's just not always true. What you see may not be what you got. Uh, and so working hard and thinking about the baseline, which is what would have happened if you hadn't had a policy, and comparing those two is shockingly rare. So just even that simple question that I am sure every undergraduate at Bard understands, which is compare what happened to what would otherwise have happened. Uh, really doesn't always get done. Uh, and it makes a big, big difference in the world of conservation policy. So I'm going to try to argue that. And the second thing at the end is to say, uh, even in what I've done, I'll have left out a lot. I won't have included uh, political aspects, various socioeconomic aspects, various ecological aspects. My point will hold, but it won't be sufficient to do the right policy. To get to the right policy, you want different kinds of social sciences integrated with different kinds of natural sciences, integrated with real policy processes and real social institutional network creation processes that we just heard about. So I'm going to be a little bit more narrow to push uh, use data, uh, use data and ask basic questions, uh, but then try to say that's just a piece of a lot of things you've got to do before you get to the right uh, policies. So to convince you that uh, people don't do this all the time, I'll start with Tom Friedman's op-ed in the Times on payments for ecosystem services uh, a week or two ago or something, in which the ex-minister of the environment in Costa Rica, Carlos Manuel Rodriguez, casually says, hey, we have payments, and you know what? We've doubled the amount of forest in Costa Rica. So those are both true. <laughs> but it seems to be implied that payments doubled it. That is absolutely incorrect. There's no question about it. And not only that, Rodriguez is an author on one of my papers saying that. So, but yet it is very popular and reasonable to go out there and try and say all good things about a policy. 